Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at another interesting new firearms reference book. This is The Italian Vetterly Rifle by Robert Wilsey, published by Mowbray. Uh, just recently published, uh, 2016. It's interesting, it seems like there have been more than a few interesting new books in just the last year or two. So I picked a copy of this up because there is virtually nothing else out there on the Vetterly Rifle system, and I was really curious to both to know more and to find out if this was going to be a good resource. Uh, much to my happiness, it is. It's in fact an excellent resource. Um, it is about 167 pages, including endnotes. Um, includes a decent number of photographs. It's not all pictures. They, the, the photographs are, are good for explanation, but then also leave plenty of space in the book for descriptive and technical reference text. Um, and the book is pretty well organized. It's set up um, first with the, starts with the adoption of the Vetterli by Italy. Of course, the Vetterli was first adopted by Switzerland, um, and in that form it was the first bolt-action rifle, uh, bolt-action repeating rifle, adopted uh, in Europe. It, pretty cool. A lot of people don't really recognize the, the um, relevance or the, the importance of the Vetterli system in that way. At any rate, the Italians adopted it in 1870. Uh, first chapter in here discusses some of the other options they did look at and the trials that led to the adoption of the Vetterli. And in that 1870 variation, it was a single shot bolt action rifle in 10.35 millimeter, big black powder cartridge, uh, the model of 1870. Uh, that stuck around for a little while and there are a bunch of different versions of them in different lengths. Um, rifles, carbines, everything in between. And Wilsey discusses all of those different variations, including some things like Royal Guard rifles that you very rarely see. Then uh, it moves into the model of 1870-87, which is when they adopted or adapted uh, the Vitali magazine system. Uh, Vitali's magazine was used only by two different countries. Italy added it to the Vetterli, and uh, the, what is it, the Dutch added it to the Beaumont rifle. Uh, and that, that turned it from a single shot rifle into a four shot repeating rifle, uh, still in 10.35 millimeter, big black powder cartridge. And there are a number of different varieties of the 70-87 rifles as well, which Wilsey discusses each one in detail. Um, again, different cartridge lengths, um, a couple different magazine variations. In fact, what was interesting is, thanks to this book, I was finally able to really identify what was going on with my Vetterly here, which turns out to have been a Tipo P, kind of an early experiment on adapting the Vitali magazine. What they normally would do is add a big retaining plate um, on the bottom of the stock, because the Vitali magazine required this big cutout on the bottom of the stock, which made the stock pretty weak. Um, they first tried just adding a couple of reinforcing bolts here to stabilize the magazine, and the problem was that tended to lead to cracked stocks, like my badly cracked stock. So they did away with that and added a reinforcing plate instead. And uh, the reinforcing plate is what you virtually always see, but it is thanks to this book that I actually have some definitive information on what exactly this thing was with those weird bolt holes. Uh, moving on from there, the the 1880 or the 1870/87 was then refitted once again for the 6.5 Carcano cartridge uh, in 1915, and this is um, a modification of that type as well, and that was to use them as basically emergency. Uh, rear-line weapons, or sometimes maybe front-line weapons, in World War I, when they had a significant shortage of arms. So uh, changed up the magazine, got rid of the Vitali magazine, added the Carcano-type magazine, and um, again, Wilsey discusses all the different variations of that, things like the Tipo P, um, although that's more the Vitali magazine, but it's an adaptation into the Carcano system, uh, different lengths, the the process that was used to rebore these guns, to turn them from 10.35 millimeter barrels down to 6.5 millimeter barrels. Then, um, and there was a last version, there were actually some 1930s training carbines that were made out of Vetterly rifles, and those are covered in here as well. And from there, what's kind of cool is the book actually then continues into um, accessories and ammunition, which is fairly typical for this style of book, but there's particularly good information on the different cartridges that were made for the Vitali, um, as well as the Carcano, uh, the Carcano conversions. Uh, there is, uh, the information on the accessories is pretty typical, 
bayonets, cartridge pouches, that sort of thing. But the ammunition information is better than most. Uh, and then there's another section at the end of the book about historical usage of the Vetterli rifles. The Vetterlis, the Vetterli Vitalis, and the Vetterli Carcanos. And that's pretty cool. Um, I think a lot of people won't recognize just how extensively these rifles were actually used. So there is, of course, primarily discussion about use of them by the Italian military as well as the Italian colonial military, uh, use in Ethiopia, use by the Ethiopians, and then a number of other places these rifles got to that you might not be aware of. A uh, major one being the Irish, uh, purchased and smuggled in a whole bunch of uh, Vetterli rifles. They were, used, they were sent to Russia as World War I military aid. Um, they were, of course, captured by the Germans and the Austro-Hungarian forces in World War I as well. Um, where else did these... Have? A whole bunch of different places that these ended up. Uh, Spanish Civil War is another one. And all of these are covered in uh, one of the final sections of the book here, as well as discussion of the different factories that were producing these rifles for the Italian military. That's also cool information because those are the same factories that were producing a lot of the other rifles for the Italian military. So that's information that carries over. It's not just applicable to the Vetterlis, but also the Carcanos and later production as well to some extent. So overall, it's a relatively small book, uh, 167 pages. The writing isn't quite as gripping as some others that I've read. This is another book that kind of has a job it first has to convince you to be interested in the Vetterli if you're not to begin with, and there probably aren't a whole lot of people who are really super interested in the Vetterli in the first place. Um, if you're willing to put some effort into it, this book will do that. It'll show you all of the cool history behind the gun that you probably weren't aware of, although I don't know that it quite does it as successfully as, for example, van der Linden's book on um, Belgian Mausers. That was a really surprisingly engaging book. This book has the information, but the writing isn't quite as, as snappy and, and grabbing. So um, it is available from Mowbray, it's available on Amazon, it's available at gun shows, which is where I first actually noticed it. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, if you're interested in the Italian rifles, or I would say in development of the early bolt action military rifles, it's hard to find much information on the Vetterli, and this book really fixes that problem. So there's a link in the description below where you can find a copy for yourself. Check it out if you're interested. Thanks for watching, and tune in next week for another book review on Forgotten Weapons.